Our New Testament text today is Mark 11, verses 27 through 33. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. Again, they came to Jerusalem. As he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him and said, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? Answer me. They argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say of human origin? They were afraid of the crowd, for all regarded John as truly a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Lord, in the quiet of this time, in this sanctuary, and as we send this out over the internet to be viewed at home, we ask your blessing. Prepare our hearts, O oh God, for your word today. And may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all of our hearts, all who are watching, be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before we get into the text today, one note from the liturgical calendar. Today is Trinity Sunday. This is the day in the church's year on the liturgical calendar, when we remember and lift up the mystery of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God, three persons, reigning from all time, through all time, and for all eternity. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Emmanuel, God with us. The advocate and the helper. All of these make reference to the mystery of the God who is love. When we come together to sing praises to his name, it is the triune God whom we worship. The Westminster Confession says it oh so clearly, and so I want to read this to you so I get it right. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. So, I'm looking around the sanctuary to see if there are any questions about that. And seeing none, I'm going to just assume that you all have understood this completely. So I want you to watch your mailbox for the take-home quiz that we will be mailing out later this week. Just kidding. But in a more serious way, the Trinity is a doctrine and an understanding derived from how God has chosen to reveal himself to us. The full nature and character of God is not known to us, reminding us that we are mortal and he is immortal. But to the extent that God has willed to reveal himself, we have reason to marvel at his love for us. In Psalm 8, David mused, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? In short, David was in awe. When we think about the Trinity, we are in awe. And that's about all I'm going to say regarding the Trinity today, other than this observation. If you want to grow close to God, dwelling on the mystery and the wonder of the Trinity will draw you near. 
On the other hand, if you only want to know about God, the doctrine of the Trinity is much more likely just to give you a headache. Well, when we last talked about things in the Gospel of Mark to get to our scripture text, it was a few weeks ago. Jesus, at that point, was approaching Jerusalem with the disciples and the crowds, and they were amazed because, despite the threats posed by the temple authorities, Israel's political leaders, and the Roman army, Jesus was out front leading the parade. What normally follows in a sermon series is the Palm Sunday account of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Well, we covered that back at the beginning of April. So today, we're going to move into that last week of Jesus' life, looking at his teaching, his confrontations with the authorities, and his passion. By the way, do you know why we call it Christ's Passion? Lloyd Ogilvie, who was former pastor of Hollywood Presbyterian Church and chaplain of the U.S. Senate, wrote, Acts 1-3 is a fulcrum text. He, Christ that is, presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs. Here, pathane, the Greek word for suffering, is the second aorist act of it, which is a Greek tense, of pasco, which is the word for passion. Pathane is also used in Acts 17.3 and 26.23 for Christ's suffering, his substitutionary vicarious sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's why we call it his passion. But back to our narrative. Jerusalem, the city, was packed with pilgrims, visitors from around the country who had come for the purpose of celebrating the Passover. Security was tight because the Romans, even though they allowed these festivals, were concerned about the potential for violence and insurrection. And one only has to look at the news this week to see why Romans would have been on high alert when rowdy, motivated, and passionate crowds all gathered in tight spaces. It only takes one or a few, like say a dozen disciples, for things to get out of hand in a hurry. News about Jesus had come into the city and the parade in his honor only served to increase the anxious atmosphere within the city. And in Mark, the Palm Sunday processional concluded with this note. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, Jesus cleansed the temple. And Mark wrote this, when the chief priests and the scribes heard it, Jesus' condemnation of the temple practices, they kept looking for a way to kill him. For they were afraid of him because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. And that's where we pick up our narrative today. The religious authorities were waiting for him the next time Jesus came into the city. The three groups described here, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, they made up the Sanhedrin, the same group that would later hold the trial for Jesus. They were the ones charged with the responsibility of the governing activities in the temple. Jesus' parade on Palm Sunday, leading to the, into the demonstration in the temple where he overturned over all the marketers' tables, that wasn't something that they approved or would allow. So when Jesus and the disciples came into the city, the religious authorities confronted him. By what authority, they asked, are you doing these things? Who gave you that authority? Essentially, this was the, let me see your license conversation. They knew that no one inside the temple establishment gave approval, so it was really a trick question. Either Jesus would say he did it without authority, which would hurt his cause, 
Or he would say that he has a God-given right to do it, which, ironically, he did, which will help their case against him regarding blasphemy. Well, Jesus was neither impressed nor intimidated by their presence or their demand. So he responded by saying, tell you what, I'll ask you a question. Answer me, and I will answer you. What an opportunity these leaders missed. Jesus gave them an incredible opportunity. Answer my question, and I will answer yours. The only way to blow this chance was to not answer. And that's exactly what they did. In other words, they were unwilling to take a chance or make a decision. I mean, Mark reported their calculation. If we say this, he'll say that. And if we say that, people are going to turn on us. So they chose not to answer. We don't know. But stop here for a moment and look closely. Jesus didn't say, answer me rightly. And I will answer, I will tell you. He only commanded them, answer me. Would they submit to even this basic command from the Lord? No. The reason for not answering wasn't a lack of information, but it was a lack of conviction. They had two potential responses, but refused to commit to either of them. And the irony is, and it's a terrible irony, that they were the ones who were charged with the responsibility of protecting the temple, worship, uh, the temple area from false prophets. Jesus' question was like a laser precisely pinpointing their nerve. They said from heaven, they couldn't justify how they rejected John. If they said from human origin, they feared how the crowd would react. They didn't lack information. They lacked conviction. Let me say that again. They did not lack information. They lacked conviction. Everything they needed to know in order to make an answer was available to them. They all knew who Jesus was talking about. It wasn't as if they were in a position to ask honestly, who? They all knew what was at stake. The same condition exists in many, many people today. Perhaps even people who are watching this video this morning. There are so many, even church people, who have never surrendered their lives to Jesus. They're content to sit and evaluate the quality of each Sunday morning's worship service. Good sermon, bad sermon, good music, not so good music, I mean, there's that cool detachment that, prevent, that, that prevents controversy by avoiding conviction. But no, that cool conviction, or I'm sorry, that cool detachment didn't work for the Sadducees with Jesus. Answering required a decision. It required conviction. Answering Jesus required conviction then and it does now. Jesus commands, answer me. Your eternal salvation is not dependent on the quality of the worship services you view or you attend. If I preach a dog of a sermon and you get nothing from it, you are not excused from having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If the choir or the band sings a piece that doesn't please you or speak to you, that does not excuse you from serving Jesus Christ as the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. What Jesus had done here was turn the tables on the authorities. He had specifically had not answered their question. He didn't recognize their authority over him. Instead, he asserted his authority over them by positing the question and demanding an answer. They were required to answer him. He was not required to answer them. Well, likewise, we 
are required to answer him. He is not required to answer us. And Jesus asks you and asks me the same question every day. Who do you say I am? It's a question of commitment. Back in my younger years, if any of you can remember, you know, long before the virus, and in fact, in this case, before 9-11, I used to travel a lot, I used to fly a lot, and many travelers are talkative. I tend to not be. So before the introduction and the ubiquity of iPhones, smartphones, iPods, iPads, AirPods, you get it. Before any of that existed, I had a lot of people talk to me on airplanes. I had a number of discussions with people who, upon finding out that I was in ministry, told me they wanted to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but they just couldn't make up their minds. I mean, this happened multiple times. And going cross country on a plane allowed for a lot of open time to have more in-depth conversations than you normally might. Okay, I would reply. What's holding you back? I have questions I just can't get past. What kinds of questions? And normally these questions had to do with seven-day creationism, virgin birth, some other thing. All right, I, I would say. What else? And I would ask them to list all the questions they had. Now, if those questions were answered to your satisfaction, would you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Hmm. Hemming, hawing, people looking for other seats to go sit. Why? Because it's not information people are lacking. It's conviction. Faith requires a willingness to step out. It requires a willingness to be vulnerable. It requires a willingness to be wrong. Well, you know, I don't want to become a Jesus freak or anything like that. Well, why not? Because I'd lose all my friends and people would think I'm weird. All right, let's say you win the lottery. Would you not share your good news and joy with your friends because, you know, you'd be afraid that they would look at you differently? No. Would you care if other people thought you were weird? No. Then why, if what we're talking about is eternal salvation, your adoption as a child of God, your position as a co-heir of the kingdom of God with Christ, why would you not share that with others? It's not information that people are lacking. It's conviction. People don't commit to Jesus because they're afraid. And that same fear often prevents us from seeing the real Jesus. How do we know that a lack of conviction was the root cause of the authority's refusal to answer Jesus? Because Mark told us. They were afraid of Jesus' response if they said John's authority came from heaven. And they were afraid of the crowd's response if they said that John was not a prophet. In other words, they were more afraid of the consequences of their answer than they were with what was the truth. Fear. It is a powerful force. It's not rational. It's not something we can get rid of simply by trying to think our way through it. Humans fear many things, death, illness, teenagers, people who look different, languages we don't understand. We fear the things that make us feel out of control. During his years as premier of the Soviet Union, Nikita Khrushchev denounced many of the policies and the atrocities of Joseph Stalin. And once, as he was censuring Stalin at a public meeting, Khrushchev was interrupted by a shout from a heckler in the audience. Hey, you were one of Stalin's colleagues. Why didn't you stop him? Who said that? Roared Khrushchev. 
An agonizing silence followed as nobody in the room dared move a muscle. And then Khrushchev replied quietly, now you know why. We fear embarrassment, we fear failure, we fear letting down others whose opinions matter to us. We fear losing what we have. We fear having to change. We fear getting older. We're afraid that we're going to lose the ability to take care of ourselves. The problem is that we fear those things more than we fear God. Yes, the fear of God is a good thing. It's the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom and not the end. Perfect love casts out fear, but perfect love comes from an intimate knowledge of the loving one. We tend to have things backward. We tend to think, take God's love for granted and fear those other things. But in doing so, we give them more power and we take our eyes off God. We make idols of them and worship and serve them in fear and fall away from worshiping God who is good. Now, it's so easy to pick on the religious authorities here because they're so neatly cast as villains in this, in this narrative. Yet the flaw in their character is not so far away from us today. We need to be careful before we start feeling good about ourselves because, you know, well, at least we're not like them. The religious authorities knew their scripture. They knew and they could recite chapter and verse about God's deliverance of the Israelites from slavery. They knew the prophets. They knew about Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the temple. They knew the prophecies about the Messiah. So what was the problem? They didn't expect God in their midst. They didn't expect God to show up. They knew what to look for, but they didn't recognize him when he actually came. They wanted God to live up to their expectations. God doesn't work that way. You heard Sherry read Isaiah 55. God makes it abundantly clear that he doesn't act to meet our expectations. Seek the Lord while he may be found, says the prophet. My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. My thoughts than your thoughts. That's a statement of fact. It's not poetry. It's not hyperbole. It's not boasting. Jesus needed no external authority on which to rely to do as he did or act as he acted. He embodied the authority to do those things. When the authorities asked the question about Jesus' authority, they were not really looking for an answer. They just wanted him to stop. If he said the law, they could engage him in an argument about the meaning of the law. If he said any other authority, would they dismiss it because it was necessarily less than the law. They thought it was a win-win situation for them. But the one thing they weren't prepared for, the one thing they couldn't handle, was the truth. They mistook the responsibility to exercise authority from God to be the same thing as owning that authority. They were the temple. They thought they were the authority. Jesus' question to them was an invitation to yield to his authority to recognize the one who had given them authority. Their refusal showed they were more interested in preserving what they had rather than following where God would lead. They wanted to hold on to the blessing more than yield to the one who gives blessing. A few weeks ago, we read the story of the rich man who was more attached to his blessings than to the one who gives the blessings. Friends, the church is more than me, your pastor. I am not the church. The buildings are not the church. The programs are not the church. 
Peter's confession and answer to Jesus' question, you are the Christ, is the rock upon which the church is built. It's the foundation of who we are and what we do. That confession is the recognition of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, an expression of his authority over everything we do and everything we have. When we say Jesus is Lord, we mean he is Lord of everything, including our time, including our talent, including our treasures. In obeying his command to celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper, we recognize his authority while also remembering how great is his love for us. In reflecting on the meaning of the Lord's Supper, we acknowledge that he has the authority to promise us that we will celebrate with him face to face one day. I mean, that's true. How good is that news? So as we close this morning, I just want to ask a couple of questions for all of you to consider and pray about. I mean, do we expect God to show up? Do we expect God to show up here? Do we expect God to show up at all? And if so, how would we know? Are we looking? And then, is the gospel worth sharing? If so, how are you and I sharing the good news with others in our day-to-day -day lives? How are we helping to bear witness to the meaning of these days with those who are lost and lonely and despairing? And finally, is Jesus the authority in your life? Or does something else cause you greater fear? If you've never committed yourself to receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I pray that the Holy Spirit is convicting your heart right now, today, in this moment, and that you will do so. From here on out, the focus of the Gospel of Mark is on Jesus' passion, his suffering, his death, and then ultimately, his resurrection. Jesus confronts each one of us every day. Answer me. Who do you say I am? Answer me. It's a question of conviction. It's a question of authority. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Trinity. Friends, we serve an awesome God. Be in awe and go forward and tell someone. Share this good news. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, and abide with you all now and forevermore. Amen.